Well, good morning, and so glad you are joining us on this Sunday morning. My name is Pastor Moses Barrios, and I am the senior pastor of Calvary by the Sea in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, pronouns he, him, and his. And a, an indigenous American of Mayan descent. And I acknowledge the dehumanization of many of my ancestors at the hands of colonizers. But I choose also to acknowledge their beauty and artistry and accomplishments and science and all that they've done to bless our world. I'm thankful for that this morning. If you're visiting us for the first time, I wanna to say to you, welcome. You should know that you are loved that you are safe, and that, that the Creator is well pleased with you. We continue our sermon series titled, The Crosses We Bear. And let me tell you a story. The auditorium located in downtown Los Angeles was full to the brim. The energy was palpable. The people were arriving and taking their seats, young families with children under 10, the LGBTQIA plus community, young adults were in the house, people of color, black, brown, and indigenous were present. And this church plant, known as Crave Life Church, had grown from this handful of people to a robust, multi-ethnic, ecumenical, progressive faith community with beautiful ministries, passions, gifts, and people. See, I remember that day like yesterday, looking out at the crowd, at what the divine had uh, created and formed, and yet Brenda, the kids, and I were privileged to have planted this church from nothing. Over the years, we moved to 10 different locations. Everywhere we would go, God would add new people to our family, but just not any people. I would say to you, special people, people who were once blind, but were able to see again, people who were once lost, but now were found, as the hymn says. These were truly beautiful and amazing people with many gifts and abilities and passions. And if you're listening today, anyone uh, known as Cravers, Crave Life Church folks, you know who you are. You are special people. I share about this story just a bit because it's so vast, but a bit about church planting, because church planting is no easy task. If you don't know what church planting is, it literally takes after the idea of planting a tree, just like you plant a tree where there was no tree, you plant a church where there was no church. And in planting a church, you quickly realize that all of the prioritization must go to the blind and the lost. That all of the creativity and passion and hard work and faith it takes to plant a church begins with knowing who needs to be prioritized. I still can't believe many times when I would look out and think about this that anyone would come to my church. I apologize, my preaching was rough. My theology needed some work. We didn't have the most beautiful facilities or robust programs, but what we did have was much love. If one person would miss church, I would check in on them that day or the next day because that's what it meant to be a shepherd of the blind and of the lost. It somehow 
required more care, more attention than those who were already found. I titled today's sermon, The Outsiders Win. Today's parables um, of the lost sheep, of the one lost sheep and of the one lost coin have, you know, traditionally been preached with a bent towards going out and saving the lost. However, I cannot but see another glaring point of wisdom in these parables. Could these parables be about the opposite, not about the lost, but about the never lost? And the never lost in these parables were the Pharisees, the scribes, those who were admired for their religiosity and piety and theology, those who were already found never lost. And these were the very same groups who were gossiping about Jesus. They were being critical of Jesus' fortitude to eat with sinners and tax collectors. However, one could make the argument that Jesus was living out the precise meaning of this wisdom by having meals with sinners and with the lost. In fact, Jesus said there will be more joy. Did you hear me? I'll stop there. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. I mean, what is Jesus saying? What is he pointing towards? One versus 99, and the one wins out. I mean, is Jesus saying that the one lost soul and sheep and coin must receive more attention than the 99 already found? That even one lost sheep is more priority than the 99 sheep never lost. I mean, does this wisdom sound a bit off? <laughs> a bit upside down. And because should not the majority win out? Should not the ones with seniority uh, have more privilege? I mean, let us remember, Jesus did say there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And see, I think this is where the wisdom falls on us this morning. Right here is where we encounter the Trinitarian God, the flow, the dance, the healing. This is where we invite the Holy Spirit to counsel, to guide, to help us, to speak into us. Because, you know, today's wisdom is for all the veterans. How many veterans are out there? The long-time Christians, those who have been in the church for many years, for those long-time church members, those who have gained position and power and privilege in the church because of their many years serving the church or in the congregation. This sermon is for those people who may need to rethink things. You see, the Christian tradition seems to miss this teaching over and over again, or they simply choose to ignore it and continue without rethinking the matter. But let me be as clear as I can be this morning. Jesus is making a claim. And the claim is that the lost demand more attention than the never lost. I mean, plainly put in our context today, the outsider demands more attention than the insider. It is as clear as I can say it this morning. Now, this may seem clear and reasonable. Of course, the outsider should demand more attention than the insider. Then what's the problem with this? See, the problem with this news is that it doesn't settle well with the insiders. It doesn't settle well with the never lost. And yet I wonder, does such a response reveal the true feelings of the insiders, of the veterans, 
of the longtime members. Why all the jealousy? Why all the selfishness and all the self-centeredness? See, I wonder, are the insiders the ones who are truly lost? Let me ask you something. In the parable of the lost sheep, who do you identify with? Do you identify as the one lost sheep? Or do you identify as part of the 99 sheep that are never lost? Or do you identify with the shepherd? See, most of us, I believe, would identify with the 99 sheep never lost. But what if I told you that we should be identifying ourselves with the shepherd. You see, the shepherd does not judge. The shepherd does not get jealous. The shepherd does not consider themselves before the sheep. You know, sh a shepherd looks at the sheep with eyes of love, of care, of compassion, and are ready to offer more attention to the lost. I mean, what if the meaning of these parables is to awaken the insiders, the, the never lost, the longtime Christian, the longtime churchgoer? What if it would alter the way we look at our cities and neighborhoods and communities? See, I think we need to rethink things, our programs, our ministries, our budgets, our communities, our worship experiences. Can I get an amen? You see, the mission of the church cannot be solely based on giving the church members, the churchgoers, the veterans priority. Rather, it must give more attention, more priority to the needs of the lost exploring and thinking and brainstorming ways to help the lost be found for the blind to see. And while American Christianity fights this ongoing church battle about what kind of music should be in worship, what kind of programs we should fund financially, all of this stuff that is about insiders, about inside work, can become so selfish, so self-centered, so insider-focused, and we lose sight of the lost. And I guess what I'm submitting to you this morning is that if heaven truly is more joyous over one sinner repenting, over one sinner rethinking things, then should we not be more focused on such things? Hmm. Should not our programs and ministries, our services, give more attention to the lost, to the sinner, to those outsiders, to those who are not in the church? See, I gave this question a lot of thought this week. Why? Why is there more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent? Why? And I kept coming back to this same answer. Because it is much harder for such a thing to happen. Do you know how difficult it is for one person to reconsider things? Do you know how difficult it is for one person to rethink things and change their mind? Because that is what repentance is, right? It's this ability to rethink things and come to one's senses. And I can tell you with much experience through church planting, just how difficult that is. When one plants a church, the lost are a priority. And you know why? Because there are no church members. 
There are no long-time church goers or uh, uh, long-time financial contributors or programs, a budget, a, a, a thought out, you know, worship experience. You know, there is only one priority and it is for those who are outside of the church. Those who don't have a faith community, who are blind, shall we say, not so much physically, but mentally and emotionally and spiritually. Blind to the beauty of being known. Bl blind to the loveliness of being in friendship and community. Blind to the love and grace of God through other people. This is why they are lost. This is why they are blind. Because they cannot see. Because they are not aware of such beauty. <laughs> you know, many people have been hurt by the church. By a pastor. By a denomination. By some theologian. Some person. That considers themselves Christian. And so the work that I'm describing to you, it is really hard work to reteach the essence of the scriptures and of Jesus, to open hearts to trust again, to open minds to believe again. You see, Crave Life Church represented such hard work. We welcomed those rejected by the church and pastors those who were determined to be not normal, who were misfits and freaks and mutants of the world. But here, right in this space this morning, enters the cross. The cross that we must bear as the students of Jesus. The countercultural values of the gospel that we preached about last week. As the veterans, as the longtime churchgoers, as the never lost, we must not expect special treatment. Did you hear me? We must not expect to be the priority. We cannot hold on to our 20-year membership as some form of privilege or position. We cannot hold our money as a sign of approval or disapproval. We cannot demand things to be done how we want them to be. Instead, our cross to bear is humility. To place the lost, the outsider, the unchurched, the unchristian ahead of ourselves. To give priority to the gay and trans neighbor, the Muslim and Buddhist neighbor, the immigrant neighbor, the black and brown and indigenous neighbor, the family with kids who are running around the church neighbor. Did you hear me? Oh, man. You know, as veterans, as those with seniority, as those who have put in the time Unlike the world systems, unlike the unjust systems at play, unlike the injustice in our society or places of unemployment, we are to, are to counter that very culture. Because Jesus, Jesus' culture puts the last first. The least experienced come first. The rookie gets more attention. This is the gospel way. This is the heavenly way. This is what gives heaven more joy. We bear the cross for the lost. Then why would we do such a thing? Why take on such a burden? Because it is what shepherds do. They stand out in the dark late at night. They stand out in the cold protecting their sheep from wolves, they are willing to give their lives for their sheep. At least that's what good shepherds do. It is what Jesus, the good shepherd, did. He willingly gave his life on a cross for all his sheep, including us. Takes away our sins, burdens, mistakes, failures, our selfishness, our sense of entitlement and self-centeredness. Takes it all. And gives us his forgiveness, his grace, his successes, and his righteousness. 
and resurrected from the day, from the dead three days later. And gives us really the apex of reality, the omega point of history. But what shall we do with such a moment? with such awareness, with such a realization that what we have used, our religious status, how we have used it to weaponize it, to minimize the outsider, to uplift the insider. I mean, why? We don't deserve such a thing. Why? Why all the generosity? Why all the forgiveness? It is not what we deserve. We should not be rewarded with such love, with such healing, with such beauty. Perhaps all we can do this morning is go and pick up that cross. Bear it for the lost, for the blind, for the outsider, the rookie, the misfit, the, the mutant, the sinner. Because we know that that will make heaven more joyous. Because we know that that will bring a smile to God. Because we know that that will make God laugh this morning. O creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Who was, who is, and who is to come. Let us live beyond ourselves. Make us shepherds who care for the sheep first. Help us. Grow in us. Increase in us this morning. Here at Calvary by the Sea. To make our sanctuary, our congregation, a place that primarily puts the lost and the blind first. And that as we would do that, that as outsiders would walk into our sanctuary and, and come into our programming and worship experiences, that they would walk in and immediately be healed. Immediately would be able to see no longer blinded, no longer lost, but found. We carry that cross today for the sake of the world. Word of God and word of life. And we all say together, thanks be to God.